So should we start with the motivation section now? Is that where we are? Yeah, at least get the mm. overview on why why are we here. Yeah. Okay. Also, interesting notion that Enrico brought up that uh, should we paralyze? Because yeah. I hadn't I hadn't thought about it. Like I I have taken it as a given. Yeah, that's that we paralyze. Good question. And this lesson, the other name of it is called parallelizing without parallelizing. So, um, what does that mean? And is that sort of what you said about not mm. wanting to parallelize? Yeah. Uh, well, if I jump in here, I the parallelizing without paralyzing means that we are not doing parallelization within a language. Mm -hmm. So if I have a Python script, I'm not using, for example, Python's multiprocessing or multithreading uh, uh, like properties. So, so that means we're basically running the same thing multiple times, but each individual one doesn't have any special parallelization. Exactly. Okay. Yeah. And um, that sounds like a pretty good deal overall. I mean, if you can get parallelization yeah. without having to do it. I, I think it, I think it's a fantastic deal because okay. uh, you have to only you don't have to go into the intricacies of the language and what you have to do is you have to learn this kind of meta layer of the HPC. How do I uh, efficiently submit basically the same job with a little bit different parameters? Yeah. Like a multiple times. Mm -hmm. So, um, Something changed here. Yeah, okay. And is this sort of what I've heard? Um, like I've got the idea that in a lot of research, this works better. Like for example, when our team is buying GPUs, we can spend extra for these GPUs with fast communication, but the general feeling is, well, people are more likely to just run multiple jobs at once like if you if you need to run 10 gpu simulations and you can run let's see like 10 in one hour or 10 at the same time each taking 10 hours it gets done at the same time so mm. is that sort of how it is yeah and also like from from researchers point of view learning to use this very low level parallelization the learning overhead is is something completely different than yeah. learning how to do this uh yeah well the embarrassingly parallel one yeah so there is a lot of text here i guess we can yeah and it's skip. it's a yeah it's a good but... it's good text but i i recommend reading it uh it's like yeah. on your own pace yeah so what's this what does this figure here mean um one to ten do something in parallel or is this saying that if you control your parallelization you can do 10 things at once but if you do 10 things at once and each of them are trying to use 10 processors then you've oversubscribed your yeah like what what does this mean yeah i i think that's exactly what it means so okay. so giving in the first picture i we are doing 10 yeah. like submitting 10 jobs to 10 cpus which is very nice from our point of view it's very understandable what's happening and it's very 
yeah. nice from the point of view of the hardware mm -hmm. because uh, it doesn't have to like twangle tangle itself in like scheduling. Yeah, mm -hmm. but then uh, I think the latter picture is uh, if we also try to do something in parallel like in in the <laughs> in yeah, the like I, yeah I, I don't even yeah, know how okay. to describe it and that's I, the problem I remember this so sometimes on our cluster people submit jobs and they might submit a bunch of jobs but they don't configure the job so each job is trying to use every CPU on the computing node. Yeah. And that means that you're running way more than can fit on there and it slows down a lot. Yeah. So I think it's something like that. Yeah. So each job should be isolated. Yeah. In a sense that they don't try to use the same CPUs. Yeah. Mm -hmm. <laughs> So what does it mean to move the parallelization to the scheduler level? So I guess this is what you've been saying. So the scheduler is Slurm. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. The scheduler or queuing system. Yeah. So basically you tell the scheduler to start many jobs and then Slurm does that. And each job is not parallel. Yeah. Okay. There's a good question in the notes. Um, sometimes it feels like my laptop multiprocessors are faster than the same amount of processors on HPC. Why is my laptop faster? And that's a good question. I guess that's a very I, good question. I guess I can answer that from the R clusters hardware level. So mm -hmm. I mean, the easy answer is that we don't promise it to be faster. So the cluster is optimized for many processors that can be, that have reasonable price that can be run in parallel. So yeah, I mean, on average, your laptop is about more or less the single processor power as the cluster. The difference is that the cluster has tens of thousands or more of processors and your laptop has maybe four to eight something like that mm -hmm. but also for our particular cluster at our university we keep the hardware as long as it makes sense from the energy efficiency point of view or until it starts literally falling apart and becoming so unreliable it doesn't work anymore so that means that you might be running something on the cluster that's on one of the older processors that might be five or more years old, while your laptop is probably not quite that old. So it might mm. have more optimizations and so on there. And that's, well, I mean, from our point of view, we can either remove working hardware and have to buy more or keep it there. And it should always be better to keep it there. And if someone needs newer, they can request newer. And this is still processing power that someone didn't have before. Mm. Okay, so um, so the on on a cluster, the point is that a single CPU might not be like 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 super new, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and it might might not be the kind of the best of the bunch. But the point is that when you have like average CPUs in the order of tens of thousands, then yeah. you get the kind of the scaling advantage yeah over yeah. the laptop yeah yeah and i mean there definitely are clusters that have really high single processor performance but anyway i guess we should yeah. move on okay um next is concepts so yeah. what do i need to know to get started here okay so uh First of all, yeah, embarrassingly parallel code. Um, yeah, so what does that mean? Yeah, so this is the this is the like most 
convenient type of parallelization. And then um, what does it say here in the text? Yeah. It's code that essentially runs the same functionality for a large variety of input parameters mm -hmm. where each step does not depend on anything other than the input data. Yeah. Yeah. So basically we have we have jobs that are very similar. Mm -hmm. They take uh, input parameters, which makes them different. And the results don't depend on the jobs, don't depend on yeah. each other. So here, all of these calculates can be done at the same time, in theory. Yes. Or here for the two-dimensional scan, they can all be done separately. So it's the whole point of today that we're going to split these out so all of these can be run at the same time using Slurm. Uh, yes. Or something like yes. that. Okay, yeah. So instead then... of this being Python code, which is serial, the scheduler does it in parallel. Yes, exactly. So mm -hmm. we are we're basically all the, always uh, we are moving the loop, looping into the uh, yeah. for the scheduler. Mm -hmm. By the way, the 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 name embarrassingly parallel code uh, or parallel yeah. embarrassingly parallel is a bit uh, it's a bit funny to me because it <laughs> yeah. has this negative connotation mm -hmm. uh, when in fact it is like it's a super good thing that mm -hmm. something is embarrassingly parallel. So like I would rather call it like happily. Uh, or something easily parallel yeah yeah so but but this is like uh this is standard jargon so that's mm -hmm. why we have adopted the embarrassingly parallel is it like uh, embarrassingly parallel because someone gets hired to make something parallel and then they work on it for a year and come back and say oh yeah i just parallelized it in the scheduler and didn't modify the code and yeah they're like i i yeah something some but, something like that, yeah. But okay. it's just a it's just a weird word choice. Yeah, but I guess the point is we always want to do embarrassing parallel if possible. Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. What about size of jobs? So. Okay. Uh, there, this... there. I would say that the like the word first. First sentence basically summarizes that in general jobs should not mm -hmm. be short on like too short on a cluster. Yeah. Because if you have tens of thousands of jobs or thousands of jobs and each take only let's say a minute to run, then there's mm -hmm. gonna be a lot of scheduling overhead because the scheduler or slurm in our case needs to do yeah. all the scheduling and queuing work mm -hmm. so it is very rough on the uh on okay. the yeah yeah cluster itself so so basically don't make them too short yeah and exactly. i see there's a question in the notes where there's some more details there so should we go on okay yeah and i think it is pitfalls concurrency mm -hmm. issues so there's a lot here. What should I share? I I think if we go through the summary, because again, okay. the yeah. the text here is which there is kind of a lot. Mm -hmm. uh, I would recommend going through that in okay. people's own pace. Yeah. But then we can let's pick some interesting uh, things from the summary. Yeah. So and talk about them. What do I need to know? Um, well, what does the, in general, what does the concurrency issue mean? Uh, to me, it means that two or more things like codes are trying to access the same resource, which could be a file or, or a database. Mm -hmm. So, or, or do you do you agree with this? Or yeah, like I mean, I guess you can ask what needs to be accessed concurrently, and I guess it's things like reading in input data, 
and maybe writing out data if it's going mm -hmm. to the same place. I guess the yes. number one rule of a cluster is don't have a bunch of processes all try to write to the same file. Exactly. Unless you're carefully managing it. So is that the main? Is is it bad to read from the same file multiple times? Uh, that's a good question. I, I'm, because uh, I think I have Googled this, Googled this and read the Stack Overflow mm. discussion like multiple times during my work years. Yeah. And I think the answer is like reading is fine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I've never heard of a problem with reading. Unless yeah. it's you're completely overloading the system, but at that point, well, yeah, there's something something else also going on there. If you if yeah. by reading a file, you you overload the system. So. Yeah. Okay. So, but, so yeah. yeah. Go ahead. Yeah. Sorry. But simultaneous writes. So what about that? Yeah, that that is the problem, and like you said, that the 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 main point is don't try to write to the same file mm -hmm. like at the same time so and the solution here in the summary is given like make make sure that you uh, for example use when you write to a file that the file name has for example the job id okay. or the hype or the parameters in it so that that way you make sure that the the results and output files yeah. are written to job specific files. Yeah. Okay. So anytime we're doing this in variously parallel, if we're saving data somewhere, make sure it's writing it separately and then combine it later, I guess. Yes. If you need to. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Combine and use a collection script or. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Do you know, is it safe to append to files from multiple jobs? Like if you're only appending and not doing other mm -hmm. modifications? Uh, I wouldn't. I guess that's the safe answer. I mean, I'm wondering if it's safe, but if it's too big, like maybe mm -hmm. we can ask someone and see. Um, yeah, and yeah, and it's like it's. Yeah. I I know it may sound weird because when you think about writing a line yeah. of text, for example, in a file, that yeah. you think of it like an instant instantaneous mm -hmm. uh, thing. Yeah. But but it does take time, and then if you have like like uh, multiple scripts writing all the time, then there will be conflicts. Yeah. And. What you end up is, well, I like to think that you end up with corrupted files, but I guess it can be also that everything slows down because. Yeah. From my understanding of Unix, there's certain operating operations that should be atomic, meaning it all happens before anything else happens. Mm -hmm. And I'd like to think that appending to a file is one of them. So. If you append small enough data, it can always be done in one write. It would work, but I really don't know if once it goes through the network layer and the scratch file system layer, if that would still be the case. But OK, anyway, mm -hmm. should we go on or is there more about this database access? Uh, well. I would think of a database access the same way as the file system, very roughly. But that the right database should handle multiple writes at the same time. Yeah, exactly. So that the database should, will will have concurrency, like yeah, uh, or not all databases, fact, but I've. But, I've, I've heard of some of our users doing things like setting up a database which all the jobs would read or write to. Mm -hmm. I mean, I guess they can't um, all do a lot at the same time. Like, you can't have millions of things writing that because to there because of the database performance, but a few mm -hmm. things. That's sort of the point of a database. Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, and it, and, yeah, and like you said, that like a proper database. Yeah. For example, let's if we name some databases. So if you pick SQLite, yeah. that doesn't have concurrency. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so that will have the same same problem as writing to a file. But if you pick, for example, Postgres, then yeah. that will have concurrency yeah. handling. So it is definitely better mm -hmm, mm -hmm. the situation to yeah. use the uh, database so you don't get these conflicts. Yeah. But uh, there is this kind of like the compromises that the you have to yeah. you have to set up and admin the database and and also the database will use some resources it has to run yeah. somewhere okay should we go on then yeah okay uh pitfalls hardware and server limitations so i guess let's look at the summary here again so what about this what do I need to know? Did my network connection die? No, 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 no. no. Okay. I'm, yeah. I'm, I'm reading the summary as well, <laughs> okay. so that's why. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, I guess it's saying is caches. This goes a little bit too low level for me i guess a lot of it makes sense like if you have many small files in parallel then that becomes a bottleneck for io speed um we already talked about the many small jobs and grouping maybe we'll talk about later mm -hmm. yeah so i guess yeah so how i read it is that if you have uh, slow type disks that will like spinning disks that they will be slower and if you and maybe you that you should know where you are writing yeah that what the what the disks are being used and maybe that will help you debug some problems if yeah. if something comes up that okay, I have uh, something is uh, yeah going wrong. Then maybe it could be something like this. Yeah, too slow a disk. Yeah. Okay. Should we go on then? Uh, <laughs> yeah, I was gonna yeah. say that. Talk to your favorite cluster administration <laughs> about yeah. this issue. So. I guess every cluster is different, so maybe it's yeah, good exactly. to see what yours is optimized for, like. I exactly. think ours is more optimized for small file access than some of the big ones and so on. Exactly. Okay. So let's go on then. And maybe we can take a break and look at the notes here. So we've got a lot of good questions here. Uh, some already answered the new questions. Some of these I wrote here, hoping that other people would answer. Is there a Linux event to test IO speed of disks? Hmm. Actually, I would be really happy for a cheat sheet of all of these Linux performance measuring commands, like test disk performance, test CPU performance, and so on. Um, time definitely does show how much time your program is taking, but not the raw capacity of the disks themselves. Hmm. Hmm. Yeah, OK. But yes, keep them coming. And should we go on? Then? Yeah, just a second. Yeah. These three here, I, is that? The database out of queue. So yeah, so for this one, basically databases are designed for concurrent access. So they have their own internal queues and journaling and stuff like that. So you can basically send all the rights to it and it 
hold them until it can do it safely and in order. Hmm. Yeah, so it, if it receives two uh, requests to write something like simultaneously, yeah, it will inner it has an inner process to make sure that they are first queued and then written yeah. safely. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sorry, I I think I just I just repeated what you said. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> On here, yeah, someone pointed out the DD command. So DD basically. What does it even stand for? Duplicate data or something like that? It can do raw reads and writes. Not raw, but it basically reads and writes data. So you can use it to say, how long does it take to read one gigabyte of data or so on? But let's let people keep adding in more stuff there. Hmm. OK, so oh, now. Interesting. I think we get to the main part of the lesson. Yes. So what's our example for the rest of the time? Yep. So for okay, so... to understand, I'll be typing out a real example, which is partly a mystery to me. OK, yeah. So uh, we are going to, uh, the scenario what we are starting with is this kind of we are it's kind of a reminder uh of quite a realistic scenario where mm -hmm. which is that uh people are developing their uh pipeline or workflow in a Jupyter notebook mm -hmm. but in order to use the HPC efficiently we want to take that one, one notebook and turn it into scripts, in this okay. case, Python mm -hmm. scripts, mm -hmm. and, and like factorize it yeah. so that we have one script doing one step of the pipeline. Mm -hmm. So basically the thing that I often see people needing to do so. They come uh, in is, with this Jupyter yes. and say, I want to run it on the cluster. Well, they can run it on one processor, but that's defeating the purpose. Yes. Okay. Yeah, when I say yeah. efficiently, then yes, I, I exactly, I meant that yeah. we want to use the parallelization for it. Yeah. Okay. And and then, uh, so we take a look at how uh, about kind of like the, where, yeah. where we end up with uh, our scripts mm -hmm. and what kind of workflow it is. It's a simple two-step workflow. Mm -hmm. And then we will uh, run that workflow on HPC using where we parallelize what can yeah. be parallelized using three different three different methods. OK. Methods, yeah. Can you give me a summary of what these methods are, just so I, I'll know what to be looking forward to? OK, so the first parallelize using scripting is that we basically uh, we write a Python script, or it can be actually anything, our script also. Mm -hmm. But let's say we have a Python script, and we use a the sub process mm -hmm. uh, sub process module to uh, submit the job okay yeah using the slurm system mm -hmm. so then then yeah. uh, okay. those things are running yeah. what is in the loop are running parallel yes okay so, and then the array jobs is kind of like a slurm native method to yeah. parallelize so we can just um, modify the modify the slurm batch script mm -hmm. to tell it to that okay this this needs to be run in in parallel yeah. and mul multiple jobs in parallel mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. okay and and the third one is to parallelize or run the whole workflow using a uh, workflow manager tool. Okay. Yeah. Which in our case will be Snakemake. Mm -hmm. And and um, 
So what does and Workflow that... Manager mean? Yeah, I was I've been just, hearing a lot about thinking. how you've been developing the lesson, and I'm really looking forward to <laughs> hearing the advantages and disadvantages. Yeah, uh, it's a uh, workflow manager tool. Is uh, we we take kind of a more higher or higher view of the workflow. So we have the whole workflow defined in one file mm -hmm. and it is it is kind of a when when your workflow is starting to get really big mm -hmm. then basically that is when you might want to switch to using to workflow okay. managers yeah. yeah but it works for small workflows as well of okay course. So I look forward to getting there. Yeah. So do we yeah, that, begin? Yeah, that that wasn't a very good explanation, yeah. but yeah. Okay. You put me on the spot. This is what <laughs> you got. Yeah. Okay. So <laughs> should I begin with converting it to the Python script? Yeah. Let's start with the, okay. with the notebook. So I click here. Okay. So now it's time for me to do typing. So. I guess the goal here I am, I am on our cluster and I'm in my home directory here. Yes. Um, and I'll be doing these examples for almost the first time. So I will try to go as quick as I can, but mm -hmm. I'll also be asking questions about what it means and how to do it. Do yeah, please do because, yeah. Do we expect users to follow along at the same time? No. Okay. Uh, definitely, definitely not because okay. there will be yeah. enough uh, stuff going on that it will. Yeah. Uh, so this it's is not just worth it. It's yeah. It's not worth splitting your focus. Yeah. So, okay. So I'll try to explain or ask questions about the parts that might be tricky, but if it's probably not tricky, I'll just do it as quick as I can. Okay. Okay. Let's let's see how this goes. Yeah. So the notebook is on GitHub. Hmm? I guess I can open this and hopefully it renders. Yeah, looks like a okay. notebook. But the conversion is already done. Yes. Is that the same one? So it is mainly that we don't have to now start opening notebooks and yeah. running them. So maybe the first thing I will do is make a new directory for my work. So yeah. Uh, TTT for HPC parallel. Uh, and I will download the script and I will do that by copying the raw link and wget mm. it. Okay. 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 Yeah. That... And if I list, I've got it downloaded. Yeah. Okay. So uh, actually, I would. Now that I, if we go uh, downwards, mm -hmm. there might, it might be that the, because, uh, or actually I would prefer that let's, let's look a bit like what, what the notebook actually does or what the code okay. does. Should I open the notebook or the code? Uh, you can open the code. Because we have now we have exported it, so okay. so what does it do? Yeah. So so in this this is a a pipeline or a workflow, mm -hmm. and what we do is that we have two steps, and in the first step, uh, where should we... I be sharing the screen? Um, uh, lower is in this... the code. This is the file. Uh, yes. The script file. Yeah, that that looks. So this is the notebook converted to a Python. Yes. Script. 
So, so there are uh, there are two steps here, and the first one is called preprocess. Uh, preprocessing data, and it uh, it uses the SkyKit Learn datasets. It loads this Iris Flower dataset from there. Mm -hmm. uh, so these datasets are are something that comes like uh, bundled with the SkyKit Learn yeah. datasets. Okay. So yeah. it's automatic, yeah. Yeah. And then uh, we take two features from there, we uh, which are the length of the sepals of the flowers, and and then we take the the classes, which are different subspecies of irises. Oops. Oh. Uh, what? GitHub's popping up Windows. Okay, yeah. Okay, so we yeah. have the features yeah. and the classes. Yeah. yeah, and then we when we do the train, we split okay. the data to train and test sets, mm -hmm. and then we save all this to disk. Yeah. Okay. So we have the train, train and test sets and features and classes. Yeah. And it's in the data preprocessed diaries, uh, pickle file. Mm -hmm. And this is so. This was the first step, and the second yeah. step is that we want to. Uh, we want to learn or train these nearest neighbor classifiers mm -hmm. or a classifier mm -hmm. on this data set. And then we apply the learned classifier on the, on the whole data, the complete data and plot the decision boundaries. Okay. Yeah. Uh, here we are assuming that that classification is somewhat uh, somewhat uh, familiar yeah. topic. Mm. Okay. So so what happens first is we load the preprocessed data, and then we have a couple of parameters uh, for the classifier, mm. which is the number of neighbors and the distance metric. Right. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And, and is spoiler alert, this is what we're going to be parallelizing over. Yes. Different. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Exactly. And, and here I see two loops. Yeah. So we have two loops and what happens is that the, uh, well, like you said, uh, the, we have a combination of parameters mm -hmm. and and those those can be run in parallel, the training and plotting because they don't depend on each other. Mm -hmm. uh, so we have okay. This is this is the training here. Yes. And this is the plotting, and the plotting is just of the respective parameters. Yes. And it makes a scatter plot with colors of the classes. Yeah. Which is, so, is there. Yeah. Yes. So important thing here is to the, the most important is that the uh for each parameter settings we will have an output file mm -hmm. or a result file, which is uh you can see it in the build safe fig. So yeah. in a results folder we have we have a image file, yeah. the boundary decisions named according to the to the yeah. parameters. Yeah. Which is exactly mm -hmm. what we were talking about earlier, that Got we it. should always perfect. Yeah. In order not to write over stuff mm -hmm. and especially not the same time. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Name the okay. output files. Good. Okay. No, I understand. Uh, so, okay, good. Yeah. So uh, if we go back, then because we have here, we have two steps, or we had two steps. So, uh, like we said earlier, that we want to factorize the code, mm -hmm. so that each step is in its own script. Okay. And here is exactly what we have done in mm -hmm. the 
next section. So yes. we will have preprocess.py, which will have the first portion of the oh, script. Mm -hmm. So here it opens and saves it. Yes. And the second will be train and plot. Okay. So which... here it opens the preprocess data and iterates over. Yeah, here the lists are bigger. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Uh, there are, okay. I think, I think SkyGit Learn has like nine distance metrics that it supports. Mm -hmm. So, okay. yeah, we have used five. Yeah. Okay. So, number of neighbors goes from one, two, four, eight, 16, 38, 64, and distance metrics goes Euclidean one, then L1, yeah. upper sign and cosine. So, should I okay. copy the files from here or split it myself? Uh, I I think you can copy. Okay. So yeah. just to just to make sure that we don't. Yeah, make sure uh, I don't make typos. Mess it up somewhere. So copy, paste. I hope this pasted correctly. Just me or there? There's extra lines in there. Yeah, for some reason it doubled the line, uh, empty lines. Well, let's hope it works. Interesting. Hmm. Is this a V feature or? I'm not uh, a V user. Know. This is actually Emacs. I have the VI program alias to Emacs. Um, so um, that okay. makes it even more confusing. Confusing, yeah. Okay, well, that's pre process. And next is train and plot.py. Did it again. Okay, so the two okay. files are there. Yeah. And then the next section here is an update code to run on a cluster. Mm -hmm. uh, and first, we will need the environment with the dependencies. Mm -hmm. And that is, uh, we will use the singularity container. Yeah. Or, or an image. Uh, and that has already been created for us. Okay. So we should be able to, I think can you can I run this, yeah. Build, and we can let it run while it's going. So this is what we talked yeah. about last week, so. Yeah, exactly. So I did it last night and it worked, so. People are, uh, people are already experts with containers, <laughs> so we don't have to yeah. go. Okay. Uh, and then the what we mean by running in in HPC here is of course that we want to do the Slurm submission, mm. and this is the Slurm script to submit our job. Yes. Okay. So yeah. So what it does, it asks some basic uh, um, resources, time, memory, CPUs per task. Yeah. And then it runs the two uh runs the two scripts. And importantly, uh, it runs them sequentially. Mm -hmm. So this is doing all ten or whatever. Yeah, so exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So so in the train and plot dot pi we currently have the two for loops. Yeah. So it will run them all uh, like one by one within the Python yeah. script. In a real thing, would we have the preprocess in the same batch script as the training and plotting? Um, I would have, I would have uh, different uh, batch scripts okay. mm -hmm. for the different scripts uh 
at least for one reason. There might be more, but at least one reason, which is that different steps require different resources. Yeah. So it might be that uh, our pre-processing right. yeah. step like requires a lot of memory and mm -hmm. our training doesn't for some reason. Yeah. So in this mm -hmm. case, does the pre-process script, does it need to be like, can it be done once and never done again? Yes. Okay. So I like can, if we were doing multiple analyses, we could have it like do it once and then just leave it at that. Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So should I make a script here? Uh, uh, yeah, I, I think let's see, uh, or should we do a, like a summary of what we have at the moment? Yeah. So we have, sure. so we have okay. the preprocess.py script, Python script. We have the train and plot Python script. And in the train and plot, we do two for loops. Okay. Yeah. And then we have a slurm script to oh, run the code in that's... like sequentially without, Here. without any parallelization. Mm -hmm. Using one CPU, it seems. Yeah. Uh, yeah. And memory is one giga and time is one hour. Yeah. Okay. So, okay. What should I name the script? Uh, I think you can name it. Uh, sub sh or submit sequentially or non-parallel maybe right yeah it needs to have that in there okay well nano doesn't have extra lines okay good okay. so now it's all here yeah so do we go to the next one now should we yes, look at so... the notes what questions do people have yeah yeah definitely can you see these also? There's questions, snake make, fireworks. Yeah, the what is the container used in the example? So uh, so it's a obtainer or a singularity container. And and yeah, uh, it was made in or been created in advance and it's okay. Yeah. yeah. So, so you made so, this for this lesson? Yeah, I, uh, Thomas made it. Okay. Yeah. I can't. Okay. I can't take. Right? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Um. Do we need to make a container? No, it was just easier here. Mm. And actually, it is kind of nice here. At first, I thought, oh, a container. Do I want to have to use this? But you know, I really don't have to do anything else. There's just one pull command. So yes. that feels kind of good. Yes, exactly. Okay. I I agree. Yeah. I was, I was also kind of like, oh man, do we have to, <laughs> do we have to like juggle with images? But no, just yeah. one pull. Okay. Um, should we go on then? Yes. Yes. So there's seven minutes to the break. We can parallelize using scripting. Yeah. I guess we're running a little bit behind, but that's okay. So okay. what happens here? Okay. So even if we are using this happily, happily parallel uh, type of approach, uh, there still needs to be, we need to make modifications. Ah, uh, okay. So we can just like, like, submit, yeah, stuff, and it would like automatically work. And I guess so, this work is going to be needed for all of the methods, anyway. Uh yes. Like yes. So the the point is that if we look at what needs to be done, uh, it will have to. We have to do the same kind of work in in a form or another. Yeah. So basically, uh, uh, I'm wondering where is the where is the like? Do we list yeah. that what we are going to do? Mm, I think it it's in. The, I think it's in the intro. So 
so basically because now yeah. we had the we had the uh, parameters hard coded in the script mm -hmm. so we're removing that yeah so yeah we don't want to the parameters to be hard coded in the script yeah. we want to give them as command line parameters mm -hmm. for the script so should i basically make these edits in there uh yes so this is the train and plot one because that has the loop yes okay and oh, we've got all these extra lines pickle so we add so i'm basically adding in the emphasized lines in here at least on my screen i can see some of these yes. lines have an They're extra yellow part. yellow yeah so arc parse is the the standard python yeah uh, argument command line argument parser Okay, so here right above load preprocessed data. So I copy this and paste. Yeah, so, well, I know what this means. So this is the standard boilerplate for making an argument parser. We're giving it one argument, which is the number of neighbors. It's a int type, some help text. And here we're getting end neighbors from the command line. Okay. And for metrics, I see we've added more metrics. Uh, or they no? are the same metrics, but note that we are now giving only the number of neighbors as a parameter. Ah, uh, okay. And the metrics are still hard coded so. as a list. So when we run, Yeah. yeah, so I just commented and, it out for clarity. Here. Yes, yeah, good. So what we, uh, so what the, um, what the script now does is instead of looping over two lists of like neighbors and metrics, now it will take the neighbor number of neighbors as a argument. Yeah. So it's a single value and then it loops over the number of neighbors. Okay. Uh, so I need to modify down here also. So basically I remove this loop. Yes. Okay. I want to edit this in Emacs, sorry, because I know how to do that. I wish yeah, it didn't I'm... have all yeah. these extra lines. Well, you can tell this is a real demo. Yeah, this this was not pre-recorded. <laughs> okay, so I remove this loop because now it's done yeah. from command line. And then I need to de-indent all of this, which I can do with Emacs like that. By the way, did we read the n neighbors from the arcs as a variable? Right? Yeah, it was. Okay, yes. Yeah, it's there. already done yep. there. Okay, so can I save? I think you can, yeah. No. Okay, good. Okay, and then... Uh... Yeah. We need to update the Slurm scripts. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so the first step was the, param the param yeah. parameters as uh, command line arguments. So, yeah. I'm making the pre processing submission script now. Yeah. So, yeah, this is what I was saying. So, yeah, it can be split into two. It can be slip it into two, and I think here we we are requesting uh, differing amounts of resources. Oh uh, yeah, this is thirty minutes and five hundred megabytes. Yeah, which I guess is overkill, but that's how it is. And then, what should this one be called? So that would uh, be submit uh, train and plot. OK. 
Okay, I put it there. Yep. Okay. Great. So make this submission script. Yeah. So uh, I see. Okay. Yeah. So we could now we can can run the the can you show the submit trainer? Uh, oh, okay. No, yeah. Uh, uh, like, do we have the submit train and plot uh, batch script? Submit train. Let's see what we have. Because. Uh, uh, this should have been yeah. a SH script. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Okay. I and can you can you session. show can you show it? Yes. Here we go. And there is the the dollar one in the number of neighbors. Uh, okay. So it mm -hmm. it takes this also takes uh, the the first argument given to it in the command line. on From, the command line is okay. the number of neighbors. Yeah. So when we do s batch, so we we have a Python scri script here which for the number of neighbors submits a separate batch job mm -hmm. with the submission.sh script and with a command line argument, which get process, which get sent via slurm to the script and that becomes this dollars one. Uh, it will not, not via the slurm script, but it will yeah. like, um, Uh, it will, yeah. yeah, ba yeah basically, it's... what you said was true, but the, there was this okay. that that it it's actually the Python script that calls the uh, sbat submission dot mm. sh as a sub process. Yeah, and and then because it's yeah. a sub process is a command line command. Yeah, yeah. Then the first argument will be the neighbors yeah. or i in neighbors. Okay. And important thing here is that the sub process, when it loops over the neighbors, uh, the sub process will will not care about the the result. It will it will not wait for the result. Mm -hmm. So it will submit the job, yeah, and then immediately go to the next mm -hmm. item mm -hmm. in the list. Okay, and maybe we can do this when we come back. I just saw a note that it's time. Oh, okay. But there is one good comment in the notes here. Isn't this going to be difficult to manage if we submit many independent jobs? Yes, exactly. So what that means is that, let's say that the job for number 16 failed. In order to rerun that, I'd have to go here, edit this list so it just has number 16, rerun it, watch the output, and repeat it again. And that's exactly what will be solved with the workflow manager method. And if there were like hundreds of these neighbors here, you also wouldn't want to do this because it's submitting many independent batch jobs, I guess. And for that, the next step, the array jobs will be better. Mm, yes, that's, yeah. yeah, that's also a good point. Yeah. Okay. Is there anything else before we go to the break? Uh, there is a... Maybe we can have a break yeah. now and then we can yeah. continue later. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So let's come back at 14 past the hour. So 10 minutes okay. starting now. Sounds good. Okay. Bye. The idea would be that uh, maybe we can run the the scripts uh, after lunch together. Yeah, yeah, because because running will basically just produce the result result files and take time. <laughs> so yeah, okay. So but there is one. Uh, uh, what there was this. Uh, can you go back to the
Yeah. So there are there is this post processing steps kind of note. So yeah. So yeah. So this is not we don't have a post processing phase here now, but like this is the you could basically expand the pipeline or the workflow by the post processing and this this section talks about that. And yeah. Okay. Uh, do you want to take the look at the the comments or uh, the 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 interactive no the shared document hedgehog. Yes, that's the one. Uh, are there questions that should? Okay. Uh, okay, so next we are actually looking at the array jobs and there is, and if we go to the, so the last section was parallelized using scripting and then where, and then the next one would be parallelized using slurm array job. So, so the, cause the pre-processing the preprocess.py, it has to be run only once. So that situation will not change here. That that section or that script will be identical. But the parallelization, uh, parallelization um, portion could be done with the array jobs. Um, so what is, what is the array job? It is a Slurm native uh, way to submit these embarrassingly parallel jobs. Yeah. Is the colon to like like every other or no? Yeah. yeah. I don't I don't know if you can tell, but I don't use array jobs very much. Uh because yeah. And the and the reason is uh like related to the question that is this better or worse oh. the the script. Sorry, people couldn't hear me. I was muted oh. okay yeah okay okay so uh uh what was i saying the this relates to the question in the hedge doc that is this uh, which is preferable array jobs or or the scripting mm -hmm. and there i would say that uh that both are like viable options but there are like different advantages here. And the main main uh, advantage of using array jobs is that because it's Slurm native, you can add in the S batch uh, options. You can add, for example, email notification that you get a notification in email when the job has been submitted. And when the job is done, either completed or or failed. Yeah. Uh, that is one advantage of array jobs. Mm. But the scripts have one advantage that I really like is that it's really easy to to navigate with different kinds of parameters mm. because you can give the the command line parameters that are eventually given to looped over and given to the Python script here, they can be they can be uh, like integers 
like the number of neighbors, or they can be strings, like the distance metrics, or they can be floats and they can be anything, and it's easy to navigate with them. Yeah. On on contrast or in contrast with the array jobs, the what we do with the array jobs is that we give this kind of uh, array of indices, which can then be uh, accessed with okay. Slurm array task ID. And that this gets mapped. Yes, and there is the this. yeah exactly okay. yeah. So of course. These are like one, two, three, four, five, or it can be two from two to hundred and no, it's not divided by two, but like okay, but okay, yeah. anyways. Anyway. So anyways, there are integers. So yeah. if you want to use if you want to use strings, then you need to have this kind of extra mapping step mm -hmm. there. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so so there are both, so the point is both techniques are viable and valid, yeah. but they have, it's a little bit of a different flavor. Yeah, okay. So, um, what uh, do we do this or is this an exercise? It is an exercise. Okay, so, so this is something users can do themselves or learners can do yeah. themselves. Okay. And actually, oh, by the way, there is an uh, there is an exercise in the parallelize using scripting as well. Ah, uh, okay. So this is what so, we can do after lunch. Yeah, exactly. Those and yeah, and the the exercise there is that uh, instead of looping over the number of neighbors in the script, mm -hmm. we loop over both uh, number of neighbors and the distance metrics, which is yeah. exactly this case okay. that we have different mm -hmm. kinds of parameters. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and so yeah. with the scripting, it's really easy to, to kind of modify your code a little bit so it takes the arguments in yeah. and then loop it over. Yeah, okay. Do we go on then? Uh, yes. Okay. So now to the workflow manager one. Yeah. And this is where I think it will start to get interesting, or at least I hope. Uh, yeah. Yeah, because the the scripting and array jobs are very. They are kind of like the. Uh, very. Mm -hmm. like a straightforward mm -hmm. ways mm -hmm. yeah like or as straightforward as this stuff can be right. yeah like it's basically yeah. using typical shell scripting in different ways to make loops while the workflow manager is really something new yeah exactly and uh i think i think actually the motivation part here in the workflow manager is is uh, quite okay. uh quite What's the word? Well, complete. Oops. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So so let's so again to recap, we have the preprocess.py and train and plot pi, uh, which are our computational steps here. Mm -hmm. And the preprocess.py is run uh run first. Mm-hmm. It and only needs to be run once. And needs no to be run what. only once. Yeah. Yeah. So you can, if you move your cursor, cursor a bit slower. Then. Yeah. And then, and then after that, when the preprocess has run, we have the data set on the disk, and then we can submit multiple jobs of train and plot. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Using different uh, number of neighbors and distance metrics, yeah, values. And now I see why you made a separate preprocess.py script because I guess you'll tell Snake make to run this once and run it separately, and it's somehow uh, all. I 
I think uh, already with the previous scripts, we wanted to have them separately. Uh, yeah, yeah. Because otherwise, otherwise, if the pre-processing stuff is in the train and plot script, or they are in the same script, mm -hmm. then for every kind of job or parameter pair train and yeah. with parameter pair we want to run, mm -hmm. we will always do the pre-processing yeah. as well. And that is that is not necessary and that is just uh, wasting resources because yeah. we need to do the data set only once. Yeah, okay. Uh, so. Okay, so there is this kind of note that the submission, submission scripts and array jobs work well for this kind of small workflows are not usually yeah. the go to solution because they are kind of like low threshold. Yeah. But however, if the workflow, if our workflow would be larger, so let's say we have like multiple pre-processing steps, mm -hmm. we can have multiple processing steps. Mm -hmm. So instead of just one train and plot, we have like, like multiple training scripts and, yeah. and then we have and then we have post 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 processing mm -hmm. scripts so where we gather the results and maybe do a kind of like a summary of the results or yeah so in that case the workflow gets larger and more complicated and and it is in that in that case it may be a situation where we want to have this workflow manager tool yeah okay although again a cap like a reminder that you can also use workflow manager for small mm -hmm. workflows mm -hmm. nothing there's nothing like wrong with that yeah okay so so here the so what is a workflow manager mm. uh the workflow manager is this is how I would, this is how I think of it. So it's a, it's a tool where we define the workflow using rules and each rule is one of our uh, computational steps. So pre-processing or pre-process or train and plot in our case. And each of those rules or steps uh, take as an input a uh, file or files and their output is a file or files. So, so then you have this kind of like, a, you, you have this kind of like a graph yeah. yeah. Where we okay. create mm -hmm. one rule creates a file and then another rule takes that file as input and creates another file and another step takes that as so, an input. Then. So I guess it's like this concept, you don't say how to do it, you say what needs to be done and then let the workflow manager figure out what's already done, what's not already done, the best order to do it. It knows how to do stuff at the same time if it doesn't depend on each other. Yeah, so exactly. Like the, what the declarative programming language versus the imperative or something like that. Yeah, exactly. Okay. So yeah. so basically you, and also just to reiterate the idea, the yeah. uh, we we do these rules that are the steps, and then. Then we have a kind of like a final rule that are the what are the what are the final target files that we want to have after yeah. this workflow. And so when you say that these are the final final like uh, files that I want to like ultimately end up with, then you can go like a step back and step back and step back yeah. to the beginning. Or, and that the, the workflow manager does this automatically. Yeah, okay. 
Okay, so. Uh, okay, so there yeah. are three points there. Mm -hmm. So. So the order, if it already exists, and then yeah, does it? Or yeah. order and parallelization. Yeah. So and it's, yeah. Yeah. So it like looks for the order, looks in the past for what should be done in future. Well, anyway, I think we've said this enough. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Should we start doing it? Uh, yeah, but one more one more thing about the uh, that here we are using Snake Make, mm -hmm. and Snake Make is uh, is it's very popular, especially in the uh, is it by bi bioinformatics mm -hmm. field? Okay, and it's it's a it's written in Python, but but what happens in the computational steps is like they can be anything. They don't have to be Python. Mm -hmm. And the workflow script that we're gonna see in just a moment is also uh, it's basically Python. It's a flavor of Python, so mm -hmm. it's a Python-like scripting language. Yeah. Okay. And there are hundreds of workflow manager tools. Mm. So, mm -hmm. but SnakeMake is what we use here. Do you know why we chose SnakeMake? Uh, some people in our proximity have have uh, experience with it. Mm. Okay. It is well known, and okay. also because I use Python, mm -hmm. I. I do everything with Python, yeah. so it's kind of like a lowest threshold of, yeah, or what is it, barrier it's, of yeah, it's entry. The common thing. Yeah, and I know the code refinery lessons teach it, but ah, oh, exactly. I, well, I wonder how that was done. Anyway, no, oh, but you know, but that's that's a good idea. Good point because this is code refinery as well. So yeah. in this code refinery okay. context, when we're talking about workflow manager, we are probably talking about snake me. Yeah. Okay. So um to access um, snake make. Yeah, we still don't get to the actual workflow <laughs> because like Yeah, let's okay. Yeah. And this is like a common common theme with with workflow manager that there uh. there is a lot of lot of like tinkering. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So and the first question is okay how we have this python package mm -hmm. snake make how do i actually access it on an hpc cluster yeah and uh if you're on your own laptop and you want to develop locally yeah. then you can just use pip to install the the snake make mm -hmm. but then on the hpc clusters uh on many clusters, the situation is that you cannot install your own packages or yeah. software. Mm -hmm. uh, like, for example, on Triton, Alto Triton, you can make create Conda environments. Mm -hmm. But, uh, for example, on Lumi, there Thanks. isn't that kind of. Okay. Yeah option. But since so, I'm at Alto, should I do the module load? Yeah, exactly. But then so the so the important thing here is that the uh it is up to the cluster administration to like provide a way to use I mean, uh, snake make and similar tools. If someone let's you can you do pip install stake make yourself on your own cluster yes if they if the admins let you yeah okay yeah okay so i will come back here can make this smaller so there are two examples there that on csc booked oh. and all the triton they both have uh have uh csc booty has its own Snake make documentation, how to use make make on Puhti. And on Alta Triton, if we do the module load sky 
this generic scientific computing Python yeah. environment, mm -hmm. then we will get the. Oh, okay. You already did it. Yeah. Okay. okay. So you making... can actually try try it out. Like if you write oh. snake make and enter, then it should. Huh? Oh. Okay. There's some. Okay. There. That, it it definitely. It did, definitely like. Did why is it accessing a license server and? I don't know. This is something that is very. Let me try that. Definitely one. that. Let's just hope this yeah. doesn't come up when we actually yeah, try exactly. to run the thing. I guess yeah. there's not some random snake file here. Huh. Maybe it's trying to activate all of these different plugins and. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, oh okay. Let's, well, yeah, if let's you run, ignore. yeah. If you run snake make help, then then it will it will print less of that stuff. Okay. Yeah, okay. There's yeah. a little. So we less. we have access to snake make. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. That was Ooh, interesting. That was yeah. <laughs> that that gave me a little bit of fun. Yeah. <laughs> anxiety. Okay. So let's, so let's see. Yeah. Let's see if the if, if if it works at all then. Yeah. Let's okay. make the workflow. So yeah. do I make a new file called snake file? Yeah. Uh, yes. I guess that's a play on make file. Yes. And should so I just this is copy I... all of this into it? Yeah. Because okay. yeah, so so what we what we need is two files. In the end, which is uh, the snake file, which is the yeah. file that describes and see. defines the workflow. Yeah. So I see metrics, neighbors list. Yeah. And then we need the kind of configuration, aka profile file. That's. And here. we will, yeah. Okay. And we will check the profile file after this snake file. Yeah. Okay. Uh, so do you want to use the MX or? Or yeah. like let's let's look at what what is in there in the in which one snake file in snake file okay because well we could look here it's colorized yeah it took so long to get there so let's look <laughs> let's yeah. look at it okay uh so what we have like what we have here is that first we have the parameter values. Mm -hmm. So this and, looks familiar. Yes. And and here is the here is the rule all, uh -huh. which we already mentioned. So we have one rule which is conventionally called rule all, that actually lists all the lists all the all the output files that we are like ultimately interested in mm -hmm. that when the workflow is done then these are the files that we want to have okay yeah so it's sort of like pulling in all of these which are the outputs which will be defined below yeah okay and and then here is an example of like a that like uh that this is it looks a bit like python but it's not python mm -hmm. per se Mm -hmm. And for example, this expand is one of those snake makes own own like uh, syntaxes. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That it's basically it it does a for loop or mm -hmm. two for loops in this case. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah. So for each and neighbors and metric, it creates this and the and it's a list in the end. Yeah. What comes out of the expand. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so, okay. and then the then the next rule is we're kind of like going from the end to the beginning. 
So the next rule is train and plot. Yeah. And what it does, it takes, uh, it reads in the data preprocessed iris pickle, and it will output the results slash uh, neighbors metric image file. So output, yeah, this is output yeah. PNG with the respective stuff, yeah. And this is this is how it connects to the rule all because mm -hmm. this rule's output is the same as rule all's input. So this is the same file name, yeah. Yeah, exactly. And I guess these end neighbors variables come automatically from here somehow. Like... Yes, it, yeah, exactly. The the snake make will kind of. Um, it will inject the values yeah. mm -hmm. from place to another. Yeah. And then one nice thing about this workflow is that we can just give it the container. Mm -hmm. So in our case, the obtainer container. And what it does, it, it says to Snake make that, okay, we want this rule to be run in this container yeah yeah which is really nice because the container can be different yeah. for each rule so if you have computational steps that need to be run in very different environments that's yeah. no problem you can make a mm -hmm. image or container image for each yeah. of those environments and shell is this the command to actually run inside the container i guess so it has exactly Wildcards metric. What's wildcards dot metric? Yeah, so the wildcards is again snake make syntax. And for some reason when you actually do the the shell or you run the command and you want to you want to refer to the parameter. Mm -hmm. You need to use these wildcards. Huh. Okay. Yeah. Well, I'll just accept that. As, yeah, as you, as you can see in the output, you don't have to. In the yeah. log file, you don't have to. <laughs> but in the shell, yeah. you have to. Okay. Why? Who knows? <laughs> yeah. Okay. And then next, I guess, is the pre processing rule. And it's basically, from what I've seen above, I can tell this is the same. So there's output file, which is input to this rule, container log, and the shell command. Yeah. OK. And the container is the same, but it could be different. Yeah. OK. And how they are connected is that, the, again, the input of the rule train and plot is the output of the rule query process. Yes. OK. For the snake make profile file, how yeah. should I? So, so what is the snake make profile file? So profile file is basically the configuration file and it can have a lot of configuration, but uh, in our case, the most important thing is that in this profile file, we will tell, uh, we will tell slurm which, or we tell snake make that when it submits a Slurm job, what resources to request. Mm. And the nice thing here again is that we can, if you see the, uh, well, let's go from the top. So we tell the executor is Slurm. Mm -hmm. So if we would have a different kind of cluster, it could be something else. Yeah. Uh, then the maximum number of parallel jobs is ten, uh, which is okay. good to have. It's good to have like a safety mm -hmm, safety mm -hmm. net that if you mess something up, then you don't like spam the yeah. cluster with yeah with tens of thousands of jobs. <laughs> okay, I bet that's happened before. Yeah. It's, uh... <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Um, and then 
So threats. Uh, yeah. This is so I I I wrote there that in Snake make threats is equal to CPUs per mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. task because there is this kind of like uh because the executor can be anything. I guess it's not just for Slurm, so yeah, they have exactly. more generic variables. Exactly. Yeah. And yeah. the nice thing about the if you check the set threads, mm -hmm. the really nice thing about it is that you can see the rule names, preprocess and train and plot. Ah, so, okay. so here we can set different resources for different yeah. rules. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So again, to throw back to the, uh, what was it, the parallelization using scripts, then to to throw back there, there we we have for each script, we have the sub uh, slurm batch script. Yeah. And in that slurm batch script, we have these resources. Mm -hmm. defined mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so here we have defined the same resources 500 megas of memory and 30 yeah. minutes of runtime mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. one gig of uh, yeah. memory and 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 one and two uh, cpus per task yeah yeah okay uh and one more thing these profile files are configuration files so they can like uh, you can have like default profile file mm. that the snake make looks in your home folder and yeah. that kind of stuff. So, mm -hmm. so, so yeah. Uh, but here we only have this one profile file. Yeah. And finally, the run comment. Or do you have anything to? Yeah. Sorry, I'm I'm kind of like pushing this. Yeah. Wait, what should I do? Yeah. So, do you have anything to comment or ask about? Uh, how, where do I make the profile file? So it is, you... or where you put it? Yeah. Where do I put it? Okay. So you can see it in the run snake make command. Uh here. Yeah. So, uh, we will put it in this. We will make a dir folder profiles, mm -hmm. and inside that we have uh, the slurm. So this is a file. No. no, that is also a folder. Okay. Yeah. This is a kind of a confusing thing about mm -hmm. the snake make profile, in my opinion. Okay. Yeah. Because you don't give the profile file that you want. You give a folder okay. which contains the profile file. Oh, and what should the file name? And inside? it's config. Dot. YAML, with an A. Y A M L. Okay. Yeah. It's also important that it has the A. Okay. So I will paste this here. Yep. Save. Exit. Okay. Okay. Should I try running it? Yeah, Do let's you think try. It works the first time. Uh, I hope so. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, anything well, can happen. And also, yeah, and also, if it works, and even if it works, the output will be really verbose. Mm -hmm. So you might want to, like, make the window bigger. Ah, okay. Well, we can, <laughs> we can let it go. Okay. What? Okay. Now. Okay. The, yeah. Oh. What is this IROTS password thing? I'm trying to set an environment variable and nope. Nope. I, I haven't encountered this. So someone in our chat had wondered do I, like, is it some other configuration that I have, but I don't know where it would be. 
Yeah. Hmm. So. There's no snake make variables. That's just that that I said. Um, like what could be different in our? Well, well, anything can be different in our configurations, I guess. Try reloading the environment. Uh, so we have another cluster admin here in the background fixing stuff as I'm doing it. Uh, no, same thing. Um, and I've looked in my home directory here in another window and I don't see anything obvious that looks like, uh, that looks like a snake make config file. Uh, Snake make. Mm -hmm. Can I tell it to not load whatever these other plugins are? I'm here. Oh, like... okay. Yeah. Yeah. It's trying to load some storage plugin, which I don't know why, because. Yeah. So, storage plugin meaning that. Because Snake Make can also incorporate like S3 and those kind yeah. of. I would I would think it. Let's see, Ski Builder, Monda, Pam, no. Snake Make storage plugins. But let's let's give it like one minute and then, yeah. and then let's do a wrap up. Because this was, in a way, this was a perfect yeah. ending for the snake make oh. snake make session. Because this reflects very, very, very well my experience with huh. snake make. Do I have any well, Python a, packages? It's a useful tool. But this yeah. is also something that for those who would like to try the snake make after the um, after lunch in one hour basically you can join the zoom and we can mm -hmm. we can try to yeah better. exactly related to the questions in the notes document um someone is asking a docker image who should be obtainer well the the short answer is that obtainer is the one that will work on a shared system like an hpc system but of course in your in your computer you could you could do it with docker for example because docker often if not always requires this uh, super user administration right administrator rights and then snake make will generate the slurm script in a core form automatically yeah that's the idea of these plugins if you see this not a slurm do i need some additional custom slurm parameters well i would say that if your system is not slurm but you're still going to basically use something i don't know what could be maybe some kubernetes or some other type of cluster at the end of the day, you can basically tell what would be the executable for each of the processes that um, that Snake Make runs. So in theory, even on your own laptop, if you have uh, multiple CPUs, you can benefit of the parallelization of the um, with the with the multiple CPUs that you have in your laptop. But in general, I mean, we are showing the the Slurm way of doing it just because most of the, if not all of the clusters that we we, we support and we work with our basically slurm based clusters but it's uh, soon time for wrapping up we have five minutes left was it that there was some conclusion take on messages yeah. section in the oh, yeah materials let me check uh, so what's the conclusions so you know before... I would, uh, oh. uh, like I would like like first, first a thirty second conclusion of of this workflow managers. Mm -hmm. uh, say, uh, so what is the advantage of using a workflow manager 
compared yeah to uh so so there is definitely an advantage if you have or especially if you have a complex workflow that you kind of like uh the workflow manager will take care of of the order of execution mm -hmm. and that everything is uh and if if yeah. and if something is already existing it won't run it again yeah. and and also because we are using containers and environments like integrated into the workflow uh definition then it promotes this reproducibility idea yeah and the disadvantage is that it might get it might be very it might be hard to get even started because your cluster may not have snake make installed and you have to talk to your administration about it cluster administration and they workflow managers have their own syntaxes for the scripting and they have their own practices and ecosystems and you need to spend time to learn mm -hmm. and get into them so yeah there's this like, learning overhead like i remember demo saying when preparing for this um today's lesson that this is going to be very like what was it something about snake make being so hard and having so many problems when trying to use it and but you know like here we had a problem it looks really cool like once we get all these dependencies mm -hmm. set up if i had hundreds of different jobs it would definitely be saving me lots of time yeah yeah and for me the workflow uh, actually when i when i finally got it working yeah it looks really nice you have snake file and you have profile file and yeah it just produces the results but of course it didn't now a different user uses it and there's something in the environment that doesn't doesn't work and yeah yeah because i tried it this morning and it worked for me so i don't i don't know okay so yeah that was the the workflow manager comment from yeah. me sorry i took three minutes instead of 30 seconds so. yeah <laughs> okay so can we wrap up with a couple of take-home messages and um i think you are sharing um this is the overall conclusions doc here yeah so demo what what should be the take home message from this day and where where can we use them in uh use use very very simple workflows so that the debugging is easy because yeah. there there will be problems when doing parallelization and uh, the simpler your workflows then then you have a chance of debugging them that that would be my <laughs> take home message take home message <laughs> and in yeah. general i mean the things we have covered that especially this concurrent io if you you know if you clearly feel that it's that the parallelization seems actually to be slower then maybe it's worth investigating is it a mm -hmm. io issue rather than a computing issue and so at the end of the day there's many things that can go wrong with every parallelizations but it's good to you know usually visit your administrator's help desk and uh, and figure out together where would be the good compromise so i hope this was a useful um, two hours overview on how various kind of recipes for parallelizing your your code um, in uh, one hour, we will have the Zoom session so that those who are interested, they can actually try this on their clusters. And we will be there together in the Zoom to help you try these examples. And um, for those who need the credit, please join the Zoom session and um, let me know that you're there so that I can mark your present. I think this concludes our 
pilot series of um, DDD for HPC. Thank you everyone who has been developing the materials and many people who you actually have not seen in the, in the streams during these four days. They have helped so much and we will try to document all the contributors and um, managers, um, whatever the roles of many, many helpers that they've been in, in building this, this series that basically took I know, almost two years from its conception <laughs> to the actual, to the actual yeah. you know, implementation. This was a pilot run, so we will really need your feedback. In the, Hakem, in the notes document, there's already a simple uh, uh, feedback form that you can answer using these uh, share notes. And later, I will try to send them um, send a form like a like a questionnaire so that in general if you can tell us how to improve things for the first run in um, in the next fall yeah. that, that, that would be great so richard do you have any last recommendation words mm, not really did you say something about credits are we offering credits for this yeah so for those who need the credit please join the zoom in in one hour and in, in in the end the uh, exercises that you need to like don't don't worry about the exercises it's it's more important that you try things out and you're able to get them working yeah. all right thank you temu and thank you richard yeah. thank, and you. thank you everyone for watching and see you soon for our next streamings in the code refinery twitch channel yes. next adventure exactly okay. bye bye thank you bye, bye.